Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of uh, Insights Now's Webinars Now session. Uh, today, I am delighted to be joined with uh, Lucinda from Cullinex, and we're going to be talking about making reformulation decisions uh, due to supply chain issues and challenges, which has been certainly very rampant the last uh, couple of years. And what we've seen is there are several patterns that we're seeing uh, based on the types of decisions you make as a company as to how you address uh, uh, your reformulation decisions and how you address that both from a R&D standpoint and a consumer research standpoint. So we're gonna be talking through those today, hopefully give you some really nice references as to uh, ways to approach it and some pathways to follow when you're making each of those decisions. As with all of our webinars, uh, remember it's your opportunity to participate with us. There is a questions uh, tab here in the GoToWebinar interface. All you have to do is type in questions there. We'll try and answer those in real time. Uh, if we can't, we will answer those at the very end of the webinar. All right, so a little bit about uh, Insights Now and Cullinex. Uh, Insights Now is partnering with Cullinex on this particular webinar because we partner with them all the time. We both have really similar visions for our company around clean label and really wanting to amp up uh, the innovation process for companies, especially within the food and beverage space. Uh, Insights Now, we take that human behavior approach in everything we do, and our goal is to drive your uh, innovation success through consumer research. And Colinex and Lucinda focus on the R&D side. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Colinex. Yeah, Greg, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you again. Um, Colinex is a product development consultancy. We specialize in clean label and plant-based development. And we're really bringing together culinary creativity and food science expertise to drive innovation uh, together with Insights Now. So I am the uh, business development director for Colinex, and we'll be here today talking about considerations from the R&D side. Excellent, yeah, it's good partnership. Delighted to be working with you all the time. All right, so let's talk about reformulation due to supply chain issues. Uh, first and foremost, when you're faced with supply chain challenges, you really end up in one of three different scenarios. The first scenario is you could say, hey, some of the ingredients that I'm uh, trying to source are no longer available. Uh, therefore, I have to change something. I have to find an alternative supplier for that particular ingredient or make some changes such that I have a perfect match. I don't want the consumers to know there's a change. I wanna keep the product exactly the same. And so I'm gonna focus on making that match happen. That's situation number one. Situation number two is the ingredient that you're gonna be using is just simply not going to be available or the alternatives that you have are, you're, are going to be different. There's, you have, you're forced to change the product from the consumer's perception. And in doing so, you're forced with some different challenges, some different questions you have to answer and how those um, consumers are going to react to them noticing that your brand, branded product has changed. And then the third situation is that you may have already been looking at a product saying, you know what, we were going to improve or change uh, in, this product so that it becomes better, uh, more competitive in its market space. And therefore, let's take an opportunity, since we're going to have to make some changes anyway, let's take some uh, this opportunity to reformulate in a way that actually improves the product, brings uh, more frequent use or new users to the space. All right. Uh, is that pretty good, Lucinda? You wanted to add yeah. anything to that level? Oh, I think you've laid it out pretty nicely so we can dive in. All right. So let's take a look at each of these three and we'll be diving into each of these three as we go through the session today. So the, the first is that match. That match is where you really are going to be looking for R&D prototypes where you can go into a sensory difference test and identify, can we match this existing gold standard product, the current product on the market or not? And if not, do we re keep reformulating until we match or at some point we say we can't quite match, but let's look at alienation testing and see if the slight difference that we've got here is going to be a problem in the market or not, because the, the difference might not matter. 
might not get a perfect match, but it might not matter. Now in the force change scenario, that's where you already know you've got that difference is going to be evident to consumers. And so as you go through, you may have more different types of prototypes that you might wanna take a look at. And then from a consumer standpoint, it's about trade-offs. What trade-offs are consumers going to make? Uh, is price going to be an issue when they notice the difference? And how do I mitigate overall risk? Uh, you may be facing a situation where you're gonna be pulled off shelf if you don't keep some product up there and uh, you're faced with the challenge. Uh, do I, like you put a maybe inferior product up on the market with the brand uh, for a short period of time or an extended period of time, or do I go off shelf? And then the final scenario is where you're looking to improve. This is where you get a look at, can I increase use with current users? Can I capture new users? What types of prototypes and products will be able to do those elements? And then with that, the consumer testing changes pretty uh, dramatically because you've got in the moment trial repeat work that you wanna be able to do, messaging tests, uh, and additionally working with that price sensitivity as well to understand that mix. All right, so let's dive a little deeper into each one of these. The first is where you're creating a product match. And the goal of this match is to match that current product so closely that the consumers aren't going to notice a difference at all. That's the ultimate goal. So this is where the Colinex really starts to shine. So take it away, Lucinda. Thank you. Yes. So. Um, this is actually the, probably the most challenging scenario in a way because um, we all know from experience that even the smallest of changes, uh, something that should be a simple one-to-one -one substitution, does affect other things in the formula um, in ways that sometimes you, you don't expect. Um, so to truly get to a match, and we're talking about a match across multiple levels. This is a match on sensory attributes, performance, nutritionals, and ingredient statement. We really want any change to be imperceptible um, across all of those things. Um, and so we would really start with the simplest and most direct approach here, which would be to source an alternate supplier of the same ingredient. Um, it, it just could be that there's a, a situation with the current supplier from a business standpoint that puts us in this position that we need to go elsewhere um, and hope that that supplier change does not impact the product significantly. Um, so we're looking at a whole variety of aspects of this alternate ingredient to ensure that it will be a suitable match. Um, we're looking at spec specifications first and foremost, and we're comparing uh, different things, per perhaps like physical um, and analytical, uh, results around that um, to see, to anticipate how that might change the formulation when incorporated. We're also going to be looking at the vendor. Um, we have to run the vendor through that those paces to ensure that that vendor is meeting quality standards, as well as perhaps some other standards such as non-GMO or organic, if that's critical for the pro finished product. Of course, we're going to be looking at the difference in cost and how that affects the, the COGS. Um, and of course, um, we have to make sure that this supplier can indeed provide the, the, the product at the, at the volume that we need. Um, so once we've uh, gathered all of the alternate suppliers, then we go about uh, creating a design of experiments to incorporate it in, um, first at one-to-one -one and then at some other levels to just um, see how it actually lines up. And um, here it's where it's really important to conduct sensory evaluation, as Greg said, on those prototypes, because we as developers are really close to the products and we're, we're picking up very small differences that likely a consumer would not pick up on, but we really need that validation with an objective method. So this is where sensory difference testing comes in for us at Colinex. Yeah, so you see a picture here. I think many of the um, participants are familiar with um, difference testing. Uh, we have a view of what a panelist sees 
in a, a traditional triangle test um, where they are being shown a test, a control, and um, a blind control, and being asked to, to um, determine which of the samples is different. Um, we then will run um, a statistical analysis on the outcome, on the result, and if it's no statistical difference, then we feel very confident that we can proceed with, with the match. If the difference is found, then we can continue to iterate on prototypes to try to get closer, or we can um, go to consumers to see if that difference is actually uh, apparent. Right. And, and you mentioned triangle test here, but there's actually a lot of different types of difference testing based on That's the scenario true. you're in, right? Mm -hmm. So you For may sure. have like attribute specific because you may know that you're only addressing one specific component of, right. of a product with a change. Uh, or you may actually want to understand maybe something more uh, clear, like maybe the degree of difference that you're seeing rather exactly. than just whether there's a difference or not, right? Mm -hmm. Some some characteristics can handle a bigger change than other characteristics. That's exactly right. right. So we will choose the difference test that kind of um, gives us that that information that we as developers perceive on the bench when we're doing this work. We can really pick out which attributes are driving um, a difference or not. Right. And this is where that integration between, you know, your sensory uh, research teams and your R&D teams really uh, are, are very important. Uh, we counsel a lot of folks where there's there's a gap there, right? It just gets right. handed off from one team to the other team without that conversation about what the developers are really tasting, seeing, feeling, right? Where, where the sensory panels noticing the difference. Without that conversation, it's, uh, you know, you, you may actually be doing difference testing that doesn't actually uh, deliver against what your ultimate goal is, which is that the consumers exactly. wouldn't notice a difference. Mm -hmm. So now let's be in a situation where the the, there is a difference, but the difference is slight. The real question then does, does the difference matter? So just because you can't get a perfect match doesn't mean you still can't just say it's a close enough match, let's go forward. Or maybe you're even purposefully making it just a tiny bit different to give yourself a little leeway. We call that purposeful drift, right? We see that a lot like in uh, lower sugar, lower salt right. product, you know, right? You're, you're doing slight, slight changes, not statistical difference, but they're, they're still slowly moving over time. The real question though, does the difference matter to the consumer? And for this, this is all about alienation testing. So in alienation testing, you're looking at whether people can detect the change or not, because certainly there's going to be more sensitive consumers and less sensitive consumers. Uh, and then if they're, do they prefer the new version or the current version or have no preference whatsoever? And then most importantly, would they not buy the new product? That's really what we're after is, is a behavior at the end of the day. Uh, is this change going to be something that a subset of the population is going to say, yeah, I'm just not buying that. And that part, of the population is the group that we call the alienated consumers, right? They're alienated. They notice a difference. They really don't like the new product and to the point that they're not going to buy it. So this could be packaging. This could be product. This could be an intersection of the packaging and product. Uh, this could be combined with messaging. So in difference testing, it could just be on the, the product generically, or it could be on the entire experience of having that particular product. What we prefer to do in the alienation testing is give it completely fully branded in context to consumers because that's the way they're going to experience it in the real world. Uh, you may find a statistical difference with uh, when it's, you know, sans brand liquid in a cup like we showed in the image, but then put that full context, you might not notice that difference right. at all. Or can, uh, much fewer people might notice that difference. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, there's also other groups of people. When we do uh, alienation testing, we're not just looking at the group that won't buy, but we're also looking at this group that's vulnerable. And this is an important group to consider because these people do notice a difference, but uh, they're still going to buy the new product anyway. However, anytime you disrupt people, anytime you taste that new product and go, oh, it's a little different than my normal 
that disruption can cause new behaviors. And we're very concerned about whether that vulnerable group of people are going to then maybe on their next purchase look for alternatives. So that's where it comes to trade-offs. And what we want to be able to do is understand, okay, you noticed a difference. What are, what are the behaviors you're going to do? And here's just a couple of examples of some behaviors we might test. Like I might keep buying the brand. Maybe I'd keep buying it, but I'd choose a different flavor because you know the one you're showing me is one of several in a line. I'm just going to switch to a different flavor. Uh, I'd keep buying it, but I'd just buy it less often. It's maybe only now situationally valuable in much fewer situations. Uh, or I would start to look to see if other brands are better. And that's the group, of course, that you have to be most concerned about is the group that says, yeah, I, it's okay. And you know what? I actually, I'm, I'm not like going to stop buying it, but I'm going to go try something else to see if it's better, right? They're going to start exploring. And that's where you certainly take a, a big chance. Okay, so you want to make sure if there is a difference that you identify all these factors and if it looks very, very positive and the percentage of people that are going to have negative behavior is very small, then you're good to go to market with your updated product. All right. Next situation is where you're forced to change. So in this situation, you actually already know that what you have available is th there's probably absolutely no way to make a match because you either just simply don't have access to enough of, in of that ingredient for it to still work within products. So you're going to have to make a nutrition change, an ingredient change, uh, any other type of change. And then you're going to need to understand those trade-offs that we just talked about, as well as an understanding of how it changes their perception of the value of the product. Uh, and that's where price sensitivity comes in. You're not looking at how do I reprice this product, but you're looking at did it change the inherent value that people give to this product? And, and that will reflect on your brand. Uh, imagine if you have a premium brand and this product is now not so premium in their minds, that can really affect the, uh, the equity that people place on your particular brand. So Lucinda, tell us a little bit more about yeah. the R&D side. Definitely. I'd say this is actually a, maybe the more common situation that we run into. Um, so you're looking at starches that come from different plant sources. You know, maybe um, there's scarcity with potatoes, so now we have to move to tapioca or a different source. Um, so that will affect your labeling, which could be really important, but it will certainly change the, the way the, the functionality is in the product. So already we know that we're going to have to evaluate across texture, across flavor, flavor release, um, perhaps shelf life. There's multiple factors now that we have to dig into to accommodate that change in, in the source um, of the material. Um, so here we, we start to open our net wider across ingredient options. And um, of course, assuming that those alternatives are more widely available than what we're moving from, you know, the differences in origin can be really big. Um, and, you know, this is also where sometimes we might have to accept stepping back on certain things like uh, around claims, you know, maybe we can no longer get an organic source of that product. And we have to now say, well, how can we move to um, instead of 95.5, maybe 70%, you know, organic or contains organic X, you know, change those claims. That's where that trade-offs um, analysis that you're showing us is really important to feed into the uh, guardrails, basically. If we get to the next slide, you know, that's going to be sort of our framework in the lab around what are, what's the priority of those trade-offs? Um, you know, if, if flavor changes, performance changes, claims are changing, labels are changing, which of those has priority to focus on? Um, and we would again create prototypes that kind of demonstrate each of those trade-offs for the brand group, for the consumer group um, to share those so we can um, really evaluate those and factor those into the follow-on consumer research to um, see which of these are going to, to be most appropriate as a path. Um, 
so, you know, we have an example here. I mean, the Ukraine, um, a, a, a big supplier of, of wheat and a lot of the commodities that go into certain ingredients. Um, so this is a very real and current um, effort that's happening with us, um, with our clients. Um, and uh, it has a big ripple effect. Yeah, no doubt. One one of the things that we see here is the you know the, the real concern over putting products on the shelf that have different labels on them from the consumer yeah. standpoint. And uh, the the question often is, you know, do I go out with messaging to tell consumers about it, or do I not? Do I just keep yeah. going forward and say let it ride, if you will? Um, how many consumers are actually looking at the label? How many consumers are uh, you know, noticing the difference or the change, uh, and and how big of an impact is that going to have? Certain things might not matter a whole lot. Like maybe you right. change out a, an emulsifier and uh, consumers just don't notice because to them it's it's farther down in the ingredient statement uh, or right. you know, they might notice a flavor change or a texture change, but they may not notice it on the label. Whereas like you had mentioned, maybe you can't get a GMO product and you can't label it non-GMO anymore. Right. That might really shock the consumer going, wait, I thought this was a non-GMO product. Now, all of a sudden, it's not. That may cause a, a huge ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And when we get into this situation, that's where we start asking the question of how do these changes affect your brand? How is this going to change uh, what consumers believe uh, about your brand. So uh, is it going to change their trust, their perception of value, uh, the different elements of desire, how they think you're innovative or not innovative? Maybe this is a good thing. Right? Maybe this improves their perception of your innovation. Wow, they can roll with uh, outages of different ingredients and still have a great product on market. Mm -hmm. uh, may change how you uh, their perception of your personality based on how you approach your messaging and communications if at all. Uh, so these things uh, are all really important aspects. So when we go into a uh, change of uh, force change, we want to make sure that the new product doesn't suddenly change some aspect of a perception of brand uh, it, that is going to impact you negatively. Now, these are top level uh, items. You actually want to dig pretty deep. So, for instance, if you take a look at value, this is one that we see come up quite a bit. And here's an example of something that uh, some data we had on Beyond Meat from a couple of years ago. And it was looking at per people's perception of the value of Beyond Meat and what aspects is it valued as. And you can see it like over indexes on no, uh, has no equal, always worth it, delivers on its promise, my first choice. But it didn't over index on defining the category because other uh, products in the category were coming out like impossible all at the same time. So it was on par uh, there. But it, as you change products, the perceptions of your what makes up the value of your product may change as well. And that's an important uh, aspect of understanding, does this change matter? Or if you're picking from two or three, four possible different changes, which one impacts your brand in what way and what trade off are you going to make? Right. Maybe you want to keep your trust high, but allow value to slip a little bit. Right. That might be the trade off you're forced to look at. Another way that we get at value is actual perceived value. So we use price sensitivity uh, for people who've used like the Van Wessendorf style uh, approach. Uh, we like to use Martin Rayner extension on top of that. If any of that uh, is interesting and you want to dig deep, let me know. We've got great papers on it. But basically what you want to look at is what's the highest percentage of people that are going to buy the product at a certain price? And then what's the price point at which I make the most money? And you use those not to help you set a new price for the product as you go forward, but help you understand if your value, your perceived monetary value for this product is shifting and, and decreasing. That's the most important part. You don't want it to suddenly go, oh, this product's not worth it anymore. Um, that becomes a problem. And using this as a really nice indicator tool to say, yeah, my force change, I'm still in an okay spot with consumers, uh, is gonna be something that you can rely on to help make that decision easier. 
All right, now the the final scenario is actually my favorite scenario. Uh, and <laughs> this is this is where actually consumer or, or the 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 brand and the product were already looking at making changes and supply chain is just kind of forcing your hand to make it happen fast sooner than later and so you're saying you know what this is a great opportunity we need to improve this product anyway we need to increase current users we need to capture new users uh, and so we want to go out and get that information uh, pulled together so that we can uh, really take an existing product and even with the supply chain challenges make improvements to it yeah this is a this is uh great in that we can start to uh tap into the knowledge we have about the product how it's performing in the market through consumer research from feedback um from a competitive analysis um but also looking at broader macro trends and you know in adjacent categories as well kind of bring all that together to come up with opportunities for improvement and how does that, you know, feed into the story. Uh, here, you know, a lot of the R&D groups um, and we work with them and their innovation teams um, who are already looking forward at their innovation pipeline and, and you know, envisioning how this product will um, grow and, and change in the future. We can kind of bring all these pieces together to explore uh, formulation changes, ingredient changes that will enhance the label, that will enhance the, the flavor profile, or maybe update the flavor profile from its uh, current state. Um, and you know, at the same time, as we're doing ingredient sourcing, we're ensuring that the supply chain for that ingredient is strong, and that we have a good feeling for the uh, forecast for that. We're bringing something in that will really um, be in that product for you know the time to come. Um, so yeah, this is um, a great. It can be a really good moment um, in that brand journey to uh, you know take make the best of maybe a, a tough situation and improve the product. It's yeah, good. for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think this is this this piece is is really good. And one of the things that we're seeing is super valuable in this space is an understanding of you know people's desire for the product, the trial of the product, and then how repeat committed are they? You know, if they're uh, if they're going to try the product, we can show the concept, identify, hey, here's what the new idea is. How likely are you to pick it up off the shelf? And then once they get the product and have the full experience, we can measure repeat purchase off of that. Uh, now, there are a lot of different techniques for doing that, but one of the simplest that we found, we wanted to just talk through that today because you can do something fairly simple. So uh, probably metrics you're already using within your research can be leveraged to get assessment of trial and repeat. So if you look at simply like purchase intent and the value statements that you often have in your products at the concept level, if you take the percentage of people who are both top two box to purchase intent and value, those people are going to be, we consider trial committed, i.e., hey, it looks like a good idea, I'd buy it. And yeah, it's a pretty good value. People who say they buy things, but say, yeah, but it's not a very good value. The reality is when they hit the store, chances are they're not gonna buy it because they don't believe it has good value. Unless maybe they have a coupon or something special that changes their mind. But most often, this is where you get your trial committed number. And then to get to repeat committed, you ask those same two questions, but you add in expectations as well. And you wanna make sure that after tasting the product, they say, yep, I would still buy it. I still think it's a good value. And it met my expectations for what this product it should be, or it could have even exceeded their expectations. So the percentage of people that were trial committed and then taste the product and say, yeah, I would still buy it. That's your repeat committed group. Real simple uh, approach to getting a good assessment of how well uh, the, each of the different prototypes would perform in market. And what that allows you to do is shift and adjust your messaging and your concepts and your products in concert with each other to make sure you have the best harmony possible. And that'll allow you to really uh, bring out a product that you are confident will either drive new users or increase frequency of use. 
Now, in addition to that, you may also need to be doing some message testing. So anytime you're bringing out a new, you know, improved product, uh, you often are going to be going out with messaging for why that product is shifting and changing and how it's being improved and why it's being improved. Uh, that message testing, we love to do implicit work with that because those implicit statements, especially anything that's on pack, that's what's going to uh, create some on-shelf disruption for consumers and uh, reset expectations. So we want to use implicit testing to see, are you going to be more likely to disrupt people, slow them down, or are you get going to use this improvement to make their habits move uh, faster and faster and faster? So understanding which ones you want to do and which approach you want to take will change the way you pick prototypes. And it's really great in that um, Insights Now has such experience and a database around implicit benefits of ingredients. And that's something that Cullinex taps into um, and considers in, in the selection of the ingredients for the reformulation. So it can kind of get a, a jump on uh, which choices will, will play out better um, once we do the validation in market. Yeah, very, very true. Yeah, that having any sort of upfront knowledge you can get like that, certainly the implicit uh, ingredient to benefit association is is hugely valuable in speeding you up to market because it can help you call out, you know, ingredients that uh, may be more challenging, if you will, to work with, yeah. or, or from a consumer standpoint, you already know are going to have a bigger challenge. So uh, certainly an opportunity there for making your process uh, faster overall. Uh -huh. So that's what we have. Uh, reformulations to the supply chain. You've got the match, you've got the change, and you've got improvement options. At the end of the day, if you're forcing or, or experiencing supply chain issues, you really are forced to be in one of these three situations. And knowing which situation you're in and what type of approach you should be using for R&D and then the consumer testing to prove if you've gotten there or not with your products uh, will help you keep streamlined, keep focused, and make good decisions. All right, any final words, Lucinda, on this? No, I, I think uh, this is really a timely topic. Um, it is something that we are working with a lot these days. Um, and I just, I really appreciate the collaboration that Colonex has with Insights Now and that, you know, working together, we're able to really sort out all of these implications quite readily and um, get to a really great place. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now's time for more questions. Uh, I would love to address any additional questions anybody has from the audience. So go ahead and type into that question box if you have any, and I'll start with uh, a few of the ones we have here. Uh, the first one, Lucinda, is a little bit, uh, looks like maybe more for you as a starter point, and that is uh, when you're doing the improvement process, uh, what's different or, or what's different in that process for a developer uh, when they're facing supply chain issues versus when they're not facing supply chain issues? Oh. So, so that's so that, that I think it's that makes sense, right? So yeah. I mean, we do product improvement work all the time, not related right. to supply chain. So right. what what's happening in supply chain that makes it more of a more unique or challenging? What new things are you doing? Yeah, I would say that um, maybe the um, inputs or the conversations that we're having would be with, let's say, purchasing groups, purchasing departments, or people on the commercial side of the business to really understand um, the challenges there. Um, you know, is it is it just volume related? So there's just not enough of the ingredient. Is it that there's, um, you know, significant price changes so that we're going to have to really focus on cost as a, a, the key element of reformulation. Um, so it's just it's really having different um, goals and guardrails kind of put into the improvement process versus if we're not concerned about supply chain, we're probably focused more on, um, you know, 
flavor improvements or things that are driven more from consumer insight and marketing. Um, right. Yeah. I think, yeah, from a consumer side, it's, it's actually less from a consumer side, more from a business side. One of the things yeah. that we see is uh, sometimes the search, is, like in a non-supply chain situation, the search is for the optimal product. What can I make that best hits my you know, price points for, you know, and the best consumer experience. Whereas with supply chain, often we're looking for one of the, mo what's the most robust product, i.e. Mm -hmm. can, can we, instead of finding the one product to go to market, can we make sure that we've got two or three variants of this product yeah. such that it's robust to market, I can change suppliers, or maybe uh, there's not enough of certain types of ingredients are worried about some scarcity. So like maybe West Coast product, different from East Coast product in the US, right. as a, you know, like based on manufacturing or North South uh, or even overseas, right? So That's true. Uh, we yeah. see a little bit more of the concern over, well, which, which product will give us the most robustness versus mm -hmm. in uh, like a more ideal world, <laughs> pre-scarcity world, uh, it was a lot more about Oh, just what's the best possible product? How do I be number right. one on market? Right. It's kind of like the box that you're working in becomes a little more constrained, perhaps, mm -hmm. but that doesn't really mean you can't get creative within that box. It's just the box is drawn a little bit differently. You know, we have to kind of keep keep mindful of those business considerations and um, like you said, duplication. So even if there's, let's say, um, because of the supply chain disruption, maybe there's a, a switch to a different manufacturing facility or something that has a slightly different process, then you know that's a different lens too, is, is looking at how that works through the process. And um, there's just a different consideration set there. Yeah, very good, very good. All right. Well, I am not seeing any other questions that we weren't able to incorporate as we went through. So with that, I think, uh, Lucinda, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate having you on here and love working with Colin X together. Uh, if anybody has any questions for either of us, you've got our contact information right here on the page. Uh, if you're interested in uh, talking to us about uh, opportunities to work together, uh, certainly reach out, let us know, and uh, we will be glad to address uh, your questions, either from an R&D standpoint, consumer side, or both. All right, well, have a wonderful rest of your day. Look forward to our next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Greg. All right, have a great day, Lucinda. You too.